Thank you all for joining us after dinner for the third panel. I'm David McIntosh and one of the uh, national co-chairmen for the Federalist Society and delighted to be here and moderating this panel. I don't want to claim to have a great deal of expertise in this area in the sense of having taught a course in it or anything, but I do have some insight in to how originalism has played out in the executive and legislative branches from some of my background. I think we should pause for a moment and recognize that the contribution to this debate of two of the people who've been very involved in the Federalist Society, uh, it, originalism and the question of what standard to use in interpreting the constitutional text and statutory text had not been a subject that was very much discussed when I was in law school at the beginning of the 1980s. But Mr. Meese, who's here with us tonight, and Justice Brennan engaged in a very clear public debate when I was working for him at the Justice Department, and the Federalist Society published that as the great debate interpreting our written constitution. That document, I think, set out many of the fault lines of the arguments for and against using originalism as a means and a standard by which judges could apply the constitutional text as well as the duties of members and officers in the executive branch. Uh, Judge Bork, I think, had one of the most forceful arguments in his book, Tempting of America, The Political Seduction of the Law. And I think he accurately pointed out that oftentimes political considerations have a lot more to do with many of the decisions that are made rather than an understanding of what the purpose and intent and function of the constitutional or legal provision was. Which brings me to an area where I've had some very recent experience, and that is the probably the most political branch as a new member of Congress. I thought I'd share with you a couple of insights about how originalism is applied in that body. And I have to tell you that there's been a refreshing new development after this election. I was counting up in the Senate and in the House, and I've realized that there are 15 members of those two bodies who were Federalist Society members. And prior to this election, I think it was three or four at most. And the number is potentially growing, I think, even further. The Federalists in the House have formed a caucus called the New Federalists, uh, part of which is aimed at reducing some of the number of federal agencies in the government and restoring the balance of power between the federal and state levels. But the influence of the Federalist Society is being felt also at the level of the staff members at Congress. Every day when I walk the halls and head back and forth to my committee meeting or go to the floor, I run into somebody that I've met at a Federalist Society conference. And so it's refreshing to see people who are committed to principled interpretations of the law. But I must confess to you that we have a great deal of work to do in that area in the legislative branch. And that if I were to characterize the method of interpreting the Constitution in a favorable light for the House of Congress, I would probably have to use an analogy of the parliamentarian system, where there is no written Constitution which guides them in their decisions. Because for the most part, members of Congress don't think about the written text of the Constitution when they make a policy decision. They don't ask themselves, do we have this power in the enumeration under the first article of the Constitution? Are we violating one of the Bill of Rights? What does this do to the structure of our government? Those questions are assumed more or less in the oral traditions of the body. And most decisions are made within the framework of the existing status quo. So I think in order to bring this debate into the Congress, let me urge the organizers of next year's conference, or perhaps some future conference, to consider the possibility of discussing the implication of constitutional principles in the legislative branch. Because I think now that we've got more and more people going into that branch of government who are dedicated to a principled decision making in our political process, the insight that you could bring to that would be enormously helpful to us. Let me just say tonight as we get ready to listen to our panelists, I think this will be a very lively and insightful discussion on some of the different questions on exactly what is originalism, what should it mean in all three branches, and what are the principles that we should adopt in guiding an effort to be true to an original understanding 
of the Constitution or a statutory text. We're going to proceed with this panel uh, with in the order listed in your program with one exception. And the organizers suggested that if, if we had unanimous consent that we could go out of order. Uh, Professor Kay at the University of Connecticut Law School has requested to lead off the panel. His colleagues didn't object and so we'll proceed in that order and then go in alphabetical order after that. Um, I won't go into extensive in introductions of any of the panel members because I believe your materials provided their biographical material and I would simply be redundant for me to go ahead and state it here. So let me now turn it over to Professor Kay to kick off this third panel in the debate. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I want to thank my, uh, my colleagues for obliging me and my, uh, my preference to start. Um, the, the title of this panel is uh, indeed, What is uh, Originalism? Naturally, I'm not going to tell you what originalism is. There's no stipulated true definition of originalism. What I propose to do is to instead uh, start by identifying values that seem to me to be motivating people who are often characterized as favoring an originalist interpretation. And then having identified those values, then ask what kinds of constitutional interpretation are most faithful to those uh, originalist values? Um, it seems, to start with those values, it seems to me there are two values which are central uh, to the work of originalists. When I say originalists, I mean people who think that constitutional decisions should be attributable to the constitutional text in some way and only uh, to the constitutional text. Uh, I exclude from that definition, for example, people who think that the Constitution is one factor or, or is useful in an advisory sense. Uh, given such people, and I think we have had a number of them speak already today, uh, I, I think there are two central values. First, the value of certainty, uh, by which I mean a public power should be limited by rules that are uh, abstract a priori, fixed, uh, and knowable. Uh, and second, uh, the value of legitimacy. Uh, that is, legal rules, and most especially the legal rules about the extent of public power, should come from a source which, in the relevant society, uh, is generally seen as a good and proper source for making those rules. Now, I've stated them. I'm not going to defend those values, but I, I, they seem to me, uh, I think, I'm fairly confident that those are central to, uh, to most of the people who write as originals. Uh, having put those values out, uh, I now want to consider a range of models of constitutional interpretation. I want to talk about four familiar models each of which might plausibly be deemed originalist in light of these two values. And just so there'll be no surprises, I think I'll tell you in advance, uh, the right answer is number two. Um, the first version uh, I will call uh, the original text version. Sometimes called, people call this textualism, uh, which uh, we could state this way. The Constitution is properly interpreted as any set of rules consistent with the dictionary meaning of the words of the constitutional text. Uh, and in a, especially, it means that the meaning which is uh, uh, derived this way need not be the particular meaning that those words were intended to carry by the constitutional enactors. Well, how does this uh, measure up against these two values? With regard to the value of certainty, stability, well, this may do a reasonably good job uh, though by leaving open the possibility of multiple acceptable meanings from the same text, uh, it is uh, somewhat at odds with that value. But the real problem with this, uh, in terms of the values I've mentioned, is in, the, is in the second criterion, the criterion of legitimacy. I've said when I refer to legitimacy, I'm talking about the proper source uh, for making the Constitution law. And I would suggest to you that this issue of legitimacy must have something to do with the historical process by which the Constitution came to be regarded as the Constitution. Uh, that is to say, the Constitution didn't fall from the sky as, a, uh, as an authoritative document. It became the Constitution because of something about the people who wrote it, ratified it, amended it, 
and the context and circumstances in which they acted. But as I've just defined the technique, uh, the original text technique, by hypothesis, that makes the particular uh, meaning uh, attached to it by those people an irrelevancy. So therefore, I think it is, it is uh, not acceptable in terms of legitimacy. The second model, uh, I will is the right one, uh, I call the model of original intentions. Uh, this is so familiar that I think uh, 25 years ago, people used, used to just call this constitutional interpretation. Um, the Constitution is properly interpreted as that set of rules intended to be created by the Constitution makers at the relevant times of enactment. Um, and needless to say, I think this does satisfy uh, both of the criteria I mentioned. With respect to the criterion of certainty, uh, this creates at least relatively clear, stable rules because the meaning of the rules is fixed at a single point in history, and it is at least theoretically uh, accessible uh, by research. Uh, moreover, um, it solves the problem of multiple meanings of the text. That is, of the possible multiple meanings uh, attributable to a text, it chooses a single, uh, a single meaning. Um, I think it also satisfies the legitimacy criteria, at least so long as the historical process uh, by which the Constitution was made continues to be accepted as a proper source of authority in the society. Uh, this is, of course, arguable. Um, indeed, there was some argument with that proposition earlier today. Uh, however, I think that it is still the case that that uh, process is regarded as legitimate and a proper source of constitution making. I won't defend it now. The third version, uh, I would call the original understanding version. Uh, and this would uh, be defined this way. The constitution is properly interpreted as any set of rules consistent with the dictionary definition of the words of the text at the time that the text was adopted and consistent with the historical context in which the text was adopted. Now, the main thing I want you to notice about this technique is that it is almost identical to the second one, the original intentions version. Uh, that makes sense. When people use certain words, uh, they probably intend to mean by them the things that people, in general, in that time and place meant when they used those words. So the meaning people understood is likely to be the meaning that was intended to be conveyed. Moreover, in these cases, a special case the United States Constitution, where the relevant Constitution makers are not just drafters, but also ratifiers, uh, that makes it especially likely that the relevant people intended the words they used to mean what they were generally understood to mean. So almost all the time, these two techniques, the original understanding technique and the original intentions technique, will yield the same result. But when it doesn't, when there is a, a conflict, then it seems to me that the second, the original intentions technique, is preferable in terms of these two values, or at least in terms of legitimacy value. Because by hypothesis, in such a case, we're talking about necessarily a case where we have one meaning which we know was intended and one meaning we know is not intended. Um, and if you bought the part about legitimacy in connection with the original text version, uh, then it would be equally applicable to this one as well. Uh, I might digress here to note a problem that this raises. In disagreeing with the first and third versions, the original text version, the original understanding versions, my criticism of those on the basis of legitimacy suggests that legitimacy may sometimes require choosing an intended meaning even when that meaning is not apparent from the text itself. Uh, this, of course, raises a problem because it looks like we then have the application of a, um, a, disclo a, a, a concealed, a secret rule. And if that's true, of course, that's at odds with the first criteria, certainty, stability, et cetera. Well, I think that's right, uh, and I think it's a problem. Uh, but I don't think it's a very big problem um, because the actual appearance of a secret rule supposes a case where people will have expressed their intentions in inapt words. And I think that doesn't happen very often. When it does happen, it's because people have made a mistake. And when they have made a mistake, uh, to the informed reader, the fact of the mistake will very often be obvious. Um, and moreover, the character of the mistake will be obvious. And if that's true, of course, it's not a secret rule after all. All right, let me finally go to the last version, 
uh, which I will call the original values uh, technique. Uh, and that would uh, be defined this way. You should interpret the Constitution not as a set of rules at all, um, but as a license for applying to the resolution of litigated cases the more or less general substantive values sought to be advanced by the enactors in creating the Constitution. This will be familiar to you. There are many, many versions of this uh, in the literature. And uh, uh, it in some way is attributable to the original Constitution. Um, honestly applied, honestly applied, this may well meet the criterion of legitimacy. The decisions ha would have at its source um, the values of the authorized legitimate enactors. But it should be uh, equally clear that it flagrantly fails the first criterion, the certainty criterion, since it reduces the process of interpretation to the application of concepts so malleable uh, that it fails to mark in advance the boundaries of uh, public power. Well, that concludes my, uh, my survey. Um, I just want to say one more uh, word. Uh, it's important, I don't want to be misunderstood from, which might occur from the narrowness of the focus of this presentation. Um, I've only talked about models of interpretation in light of two values I call the originalist values. I certainly did not mean that they are the only values. Uh, and in particular, I have said nothing at all um, about the substantive merits uh, of the constitutional rules properly derived. But I don't think those substantive merits are irrelevant. Naturally, the substantive rules so derived must be minimally acceptable in the society if this, if this position is to make any sense. That is to say, no one would advocate the application of the original intentions behind a constitution uh, enacted by Attila the Hun. If we have, consti if our constitutional rules do, however, meet certain minimal substantive levels of acceptability, uh, then it follows uh, that the values of legitimacy and certainty may take on more importance, and a person who values uh, those, uh, uh, those aspects of law will find the model of original intentions uh, especially appealing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kay. Our second speaker is Professor Larry Alexander at the University of San Diego Law School. Well, um, <clears throat> Rick has just proved to me that uh, God did intend alphabetical order. Uh, it's now gonna be like Jeopardy. Uh, he gave you the answers and I'm gonna give you the questions. Um, uh, you, you recall Dr. Pangloss from uh, uh, Voltaire's Candide, who was always going around proclaiming that this was the, be the best of all possible worlds. Well, I, I feel of the, the, the remarks I'm going to give you that this is really the worst of all possible worlds. Uh, but of course, Dr. Pangloss was a ridiculous figure, and so I'll try, I'll still clear of that for sure. Uh, I, I say this because this doesn't have the, uh, the polish of a completed paper uh, it was done uh, fairly hastily, I have to confess. Uh, nor does it will it have the spontaneity of uh, you know, just extemporaneous speech because I'm going to read it. Um, I want to say one more thing about in, in way of the sort of padding of my remarks here by sort of introductory uh, uh, comments. And um, that is, that my, my title for this is Originalism or Who is Fred? Now, we have a Fred on the panel, and uh, I, I, chose, I chose his name uh, deliberately because it had a nice sound for the conceit I'm going to be using uh, in the paper. Um, Paul's name is too, it's too papal to work in this. <laughs> and, and everyone knows that, you know, who Rick is. Rick's the guy that ran the gin joint in Casablanca. So I didn't want any associations with Bogart in this. So I'm just going to stick with originalism or who is Fred. Now, if we want to know uh, what those who intended to communicate through certain signs intended to communicate by those signs, we're engaged in the originalist project of interpretation. I'm tempted to say that there are no other projects that compete with originalism on this view, at least if we are interpreting texts as intentional objects. Uh, 
what appear to be competitors are either instances where we view the text other than as an intentional object, say, uh, as for example, when we study the handwriting and determine that it must have been a hot, muggy, enervating day in Philadelphia, uh, or they are instances where we are still engaging in originalism, but have switched our focus from those who actually authored the text to hypothetical authors um, or to other real authors who have appropriated the text for their own communicated purposes. But all this is, is, is too abstract, so let me approach this from a slightly more mundane angle. Suppose we formed a club, say the, uh, the legal theory club. We need to have a charter, bylaws, rules, and so forth. Fred, a member, is someone we believe is very good at figuring out uh, what these rules should be. So we say, Fred, you determine what our rules should be, and when you've done so, write down what you've determined. Now what we have done here is accepted a, a rule of recognition, if you will, a, a Grundnorm, a, a pre-constitutional rule, or a presupposition, to use terms that some members of the panel have used in other contexts, um, to the effect that what Fred determines our club's rules should be, shall be authoritative for the rest of us. And when we consult the document friend Fred gives us and attempt to interpret it uh, in the context of club business, what we are trying to find out is what did Fred determine? Now this is a simple model of legal and constitutional interpretation. Our constitutional presupposition, which is just a norm we all share and is not itself an object of interpret to be interpreted, selects Fred as the person whose recorded determination shall be authoritative. Now let us complicate matters by comparing our club's rules to the Constitution. First, there's the question of who stands as the analog uh, to Fred, uh, whose determinations are authoritative. Those who drafted a particular clause, the entire Constitutional Convention, the state ratifiers, the general public at the time, and so forth. Uh, there's no reason why one person or group cannot appropriate the actual writings of another and make those writings its own. Uh, judges do this all the time uh, with opinions drafted by law clerks. Um, and if, for example, years later the law clerk argues a case before the judge and cites an opinion the judge drafted as standing for a certain proposition, the judge can surely say that whatever the law clerk meant by something in the draft opinion, she, the judge, is using the draft uh, and using the draft meant something different by it, and the latter is the law. So one complication of our simple model is figuring out who Fred is in the constitutional scheme. Another is just an empirical question. Uh, as the temporal and, act and cultural gap widens between us and the framers, whoever they are, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to figure out what they meant. That's a big practical problem, but not a theoretical problem. Uh, the really interesting theoretical problems are, are three. Uh, the problem of multiplicity of authors, the problem of the facticity of determinations, and the problem of practical authority. Now, the problem of multiplicity of authors is frequently noted. Uh, there are no group minds, therefore how can there be group intentions or group determinations? Um, I think there cannot be on this, viewed this way. There can only be convergent individual intentions. Therefore, I think it is quite possible that con constitutional framers and legislatures have, e have determined a lot less policy than may appear to be the case from their agreement on language. Um, if three of us vote on term T, uh, which could mean either A or B, and you vote for it on the assumption it means A, I vote for it on the assumption it means B, and our third member opposes it on any meaning, and because T gets two out of three votes, it becomes a rule, then the answer to the question, what did we mean by T, is that there is no answer. The problem of facticity of determinations is even more basic, because it applies even if our authority is a single person. Uh, it's offset in these discussions, you heard a little bit of this afternoon, uh, that norms of interpretation are logically prior to the meaning of legal texts. Uh, put differently, the meaning of those texts is not a matter of fact, but a matter of value. We cannot f tell what Fred meant for us to do without interpretive canons derived from some normative theory. There is no brute fact in the world corresponding to Fred's determinations. 
Now, sometimes this point is made by referring to the varying levels of generality at which all authorial tensions can be characterized. Sometimes the point is made by suggesting that we must choose between a term's referent in its definition or between a concept and a particular conception, even if the author himself did not, in using the term, make such a distinction in his own mind. Sometimes it is said that interpretive fidelity de uh, uh, demands uh, that we give the term a meaning that varies with the context, even if the author would have been quite surprised by the meaning we give it. All of these suggestions, I believe, stem at bottom from skepticism over the facticity of intentions. Suppose I ask you to bring me uh, curry powder for a dinner party I'm throwing, and I give you my checkbook. In one case, you return with curry powder, a bottle of curry powder, and a $2,500 deduction from my checkbook. You explain to me after I become conscious again that there's a worldwide shortage of curry powder, and this was the last bottle in town. In the second case, uh, the price has risen to $10 from its normal $3. If I had known this, I would have changed menus. In the third case, you bring me mole sauce, telling me that if I acquire a preference for it over curry, I'll be much happier in life, happiness being my reason for requesting curry powder in the first place. I want to say that you have not followed my intent in the first and third cases, but you have in the second case, even if I would have changed plans had I, had I known the price was $10. Those who I'm discussing deny that there is a fact in the world that determines the answer to the question, what did I intend for you to do with respect to curry powder, mole sauce, and money? Ultimately for them, a value-based theory of, uh, of interpretation determines this. Now, the cost of denying the facticity of intention is quite high, however. Um, indeed, if, um, well, if, if I have in mind green Fords when I ban vehicles in the park and have never seen a blue Acura, then those who deny the facticity of my intentions will deny that there is any fact of the matter regarding whether I have banned blue Acuras. Indeed, if there is no fact of the matter about what authors determine for a world that they did, they did not see perfectly accurately, then there can be no, uh, th then can there be even a fact of the matter about such things as what language they were using? The third conceptual problem, the problem of practical authority, raises the question, why should we ever let another's determinations of what ought to be done preempt our own? This is not just the problem of constitutionalism. It's the problem of law. And it doesn't matter whether the practical authority is a majority or a minority, or whether it is contemporaneous or is separated from us by 200 years and a lot of cultural change. Now, I think there are answers to this question, though they are paradoxical at best. But much of the resistance to original intent theories of constitutional law is really a resistance to all practical authority. The wills of the framers get pushed aside uh, are better yet equated with reason, which is, of course, reason as we now see it. Their determinations are no different from ours, after all. Or we grant them th the authority to pick the marks on the page, but not the authority to determine what those marks mean. Whatever marks they put down will somehow come to mean what we want them to. Let me return to where I started. Originalism in constitutional law is Fred determining the rules for our club. If there is some fact of the matter based on Fred's psychological states about what he determined, those rules should be, what, the, what he determined those rules should be, and the document he gave us was intended by him to communicate those determinations, then what our rules are are the determinations Fred recorded in that document. In all theories of constitutional interpretation, the model remains the same. As our pre-constitutional norms change, only the identity of Fred changes. And although our pre-constitutional norms can change the identity of Fred, say from the constitutional convention to the state ratifiers to a hypothetical average user of English in 1995, and can limit Fred's authority in, in various ways, say by treating the, uh, the authoritative constitution as that document in the National Archives minus the Second Amendment, we cannot eliminate Fred, some Fred, altogether. So once we have determined who, who is Fred in our constitutional scheme, whose determinations are supremely authoritative, it follows tautologically that that Fred's determinations are supremely authoritative. It is redundant to speak of that Fred's original determinations. 
Now, the framers might be Fred, or the ratifiers might be Fred, or an average reader of English in 1787 might be Fred, except when a 1787 dictionary and grammar do not produce single answers or produce absurd ones, in which case the framers of uh, in which case the framers or the ratifiers are Fred. So it all boils down to who is Fred? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alexander. Our third speaker on this panel will be Professor Campos from the University of Colorado Law School. I, I am going to um, repeat everything that the other panelists have said, but my intentions in doing so will be quite different from theirs. <laughs> uh, the issue is, uh, what is originalism? Uh, I understand by originalism the claim that one should interpret legal texts in general, and the Constitution in particular, by determining the semantic intentions of the text's authors. Uh, what I wish to explore here are uh, some of the implications for originalism of an argument that I have elsewhere called strong intentionalism. Uh, strong intentionalism asserts that any interpretation of a text that really is an interpretation of that text is a reading of that text. That the reading of a text is always the act of determining the semantic intentions of the text author, and that those intentions and the text's semantic meaning are identical. Discovering what an author intended to say is simply identical to determining success successfully what the author in fact said, which is to say that in matters of textual interpretation, textual meaning and authorial intention are the same thing. Uh, to me, these claims seem not merely correct, uh, but almost embarrassingly obvious. Uh, still, of course, I recognize that within the overheated world of uh, academic arguments concerning constitutional meaning, uh, this isn't exactly a popular view. In fact, a recent article in the Har Harvard Law Review had the extraordinarily poor judgment to suggest that, quote, originalism now has no serious defenders in the legal academy, unquote. So uh, let me illustrate the claims with an illustration that may strike you as uh, rather profane in this constitutionalized context, uh, but whose very profanity has a point. Uh, suppose my wife gives me a grocery list uh, that instantiates the domestic groom norm, obligating me to purchase the list content by that evening. Uh, the list reads, in general, uh, vegetarian chili, uh, pinto beans, chili powder, Spanish onions, and various appropriate vegetables. Uh, I stand amid the dazzling plenitude of an American supermarket's produce section and ponder, does this text authorize or perhaps even require the purchase of tomatoes? Uh, we can, of course, imagine various approaches to this interpretive conundrum. An analytical philosopher or a Seventh Circuit judge might well conclude that the situation called for an objective methodology, that my interpretive search should not be for the mental contents of my wife's head, but rather for the formal rules of language that she used. Uh, a Gadamerian hermeneutician would probably recommend that I forget about my wife altogether and engage in a dialogic discourse with the text itself until, <laughs> ideal, until ideally the grocery list and I reach a fusion of interpretive horizons uh, that allow our respective worldviews to be reconciled through an Aristotelian exercise of practical reason. <laughs> Those uh, devoted to Rawlsian principles would doubtless insist uh, that I make the grocery list the very best grocery list that it can be and I deploy the best available political theory sometime before reaching uh, the checkout counter. <laughs> um, uh, these are all fascinating suggestions, uh, but they share a common deficiency. Uh, it is this. Uh, if I am interpreting what this grocery list has to say about tomatoes, uh, then I am attempting to determine if my wife meant tomatoes when she wrote various appropriate vegetables, and nothing more. Uh, contrary to the claims of linguistic formalists, or muticians, deconstructionists, and theoretically minded law professors, there is nothing particularly mysterious or metaphysically challenging about this activity. It is called reading, and indeed every author <laughs> of every text assumes implicitly that it is possible. Uh, thus, if I'm asking a question about a text's meaning, I'm asking what the author of the text meant to say, uh, what, for the simple reason that that is the only meaning that the text has, or indeed could have. Now, as the examples above illustrate, there are literally an infinite number of other questions uh, that one can ask about a text. We can ask, what should this text mean? Or what would this text mean if it had been written by someone else? Or what would it mean if its author knew what we know or believed what we believe? And so forth. Uh, but these are not questions about what the text means. They are questions about what the text does not mean. 
They are, in a word, counterfactuals. They are not questions about textual interpretation, but rather questions about another text, a text that does not exist unless and until it is brought into being by some activity that itself is not interpretation. So in a descriptive sense, originalism is absolutely correct. Indeed, it isn't merely that legal actors should interpret legal texts by attempting to determine the intentions of the text's authors. Strong intentionalism asserts that interpreters of any kind of text cannot possibly be doing anything else. Uh, but before the defenders of legal originalism declare total intellectual victory, uh, I would like to note three important limitations to the strong intentionalist position. Uh, first, originalism properly understood has no methodological value. Uh, the insight that the meaning of a text is identical uh, to its author's intention doesn't help the interpreter determine how to go about ascertaining the meaning of any particular text. Uh, this is because whatever methods one might choose to employ, consulting the author, reviewing certain documents, investigating contemporaneous uses of the same terms, might or might not prove helpful in any interpreter situation. That James Madison or John Bingham thought or did not think something concerning some constitutional provision might be useful to know. On the other hand, such information could turn out, could turn out to be quite misleading. Such is the nature of all historical, which is to say empirical, inquiry. How then can we be certain what a constitutional provision or any other text actually means? The answer, of course, is that we cannot. We can, however, be confident enough in our interpretations, confident enough for most interpretive purposes. Second, an originalist understanding of what interpretation must be is, and this is a point that has been made on several occasions already, of course, is not itself a theory of political obligation. Uh, that, that is, to claim that legal actors should interpret texts as opposed to deploying them in some other fashion is a normative claim about which originalism in the descriptive sense has nothing to say. Now, it seems to me that a uh, great deal of the debate concerning constitutional interpretation, both in and out of the academy, tends to degenerate into a sort of argument by definitional fiat, in which each faction shouts at the top of its collective voice that its preferred approach to the controversy is nothing less than quote unquote law, while characterizing its opponent's claims as politically unmotivated, frighteningly radical, or fundamentally unprincipled. Uh, that is, lawless. Uh, given that in our present legal culture, it is extremely difficult to make out what someone does or does not mean when he or she claims that something is law, uh, such arguments have about them a rich air of unreality. In this confused situation, uh, pointing out that a text only means what its author meant by it can have perhaps some clarificatory value. It cannot, however, resolve debates that in the end have very little to do with questions of textual interpretation. Third, those who advocate a normative originalism need to keep in mind that a text is just a text. I think Rick came up earlier, actually, from uh, yeah. Which is to say that a text's limitations are in inevitably and precisely those of its author. Uh, in this regard, consider again my wife's hypothetical grocery list. Obviously, a grocery list is not a constitution. Uh, but in an important sense, a constitution, at least our constitution, is not not a grocery list. Uh, if we dispense with various forms of what my colleague Steve Smith has termed constitutional idolatry, uh, the Constitution is in most ways a fairly prosaic text. As a matter of crass historical fact, and despite the obscurantist theology of modern judicial review, uh, the, constitutional, the Constitution's text is not full of nebulous generalities calling out for interpretive solidification at the hands of berobed jurisprudential philosophers and their academic hangers-on. In comparative literary terms, it is in most ways a thoroughly quotidian document full of specific compromises addressed to the local politics of various quite particularized disputes. Uh, given this, originalists must ask themselves what sort of a semantic artifact would even be capable of serving as the enabling entity of an interpretive practice whereby a centuries old text would actually provide answers to the particular controversies of the present moment. Uh, I will conclude by speculating on that uh, very question. In his epic fantasy, The Lord of the Rings, the philologist J.R.R. Tolkien imagines a race of tree-like creatures called Ents. Uh, the Ents are a sort of animated forest, and their language reflects centuries of unhurried sylvan contemplation. In the following passage, their leader, Treebeard, gives some hint of that language's form. I'm not going to tell you my true name, not yet at any rate. For one thing, it would take a long while. My name is growing all the time, and I've lived a very long, long time, so my name is like a story. Real names tell you the story of the things they belong to in my language, in the Old Entish. It is a lovely language, but it takes a very long time to say anything in it, because we do not say anything in it, unless it is worth taking a long time to say and to listen to. But let us, but let us leave this, what did you say you call it? Hill, suggested Pippin. Treebeard repeated the word thoughtfully. Hill. Yes, that was it. 
but it is a hasty word for a thing that has stood here ever since this part of the world was shaped. A similar semantic idea is explored by several of the early modern philosophers, including Descartes, Leibniz, and Locke. These thinkers imagined the possibility of a comprehensive analytical language that would organize and contain nothing less than all human thought. Uh, perhaps the most ambitious of these grand linguistic schemes was developed by the now forgotten English polymath John Wilkins. Wilkins' procedure involved dividing the universe into 40 categories called classes. These in turn were subdivisible into differences which were themselves divided into species. Each class was then assigned a monosyllable consisting of two letters. Each difference was represented by a consonant and each species by a vowel. Uh, thus, de means element. Deb is the first of the elements, which is of course fire, while deba is a portion of that element the flame. Uh, as Jorge Luis Borges notes, the word salmon does not tell us anything about the object it represents. Zana, the corresponding word in Wilkins' scheme, defines for the person versed in the 40 categories and the classes of those categories, a scaly river fish with reddish flesh. Uh, characteristically, Borges adds that a language in which the name of each being would indicate all the details of its destiny, past and future, is not inconceivable. Perhaps inspired by this example, Borges himself exploited the idea of a total language in several of his labyrinthine fables, uh, most notably in the tale Funes the Memorius, in which a Uruguayan peasant boy, Ereño Funes, suffers a crippling accident that leaves him inhuman, godlike, with an absolutely perfect memory. And this is a quote from that tale. He knew by heart the forms of the southern clouds at dawn on the 30th of April, 1882, and could compare them in his memory with the mottled streaks on a book in Spanish binding he had seen only once, and with the outlines of the foam raised by an oar in the Rio Negro the night before the Quebracho uprising. Locke in the 17th century postulated an impossible language in which each individual thing, each stone, each bird, each branch would have its own name. Funes once projected an analogous language, but discarded it because it seemed to him too general, too ambiguous. In fact, Funes remembered not only every leaf of every tree of every wood, but also every one of the times he had perceived or imagined it. Thus, he was almost incapable of ideas of a general platonic sort. Not only was it difficult for him to comprehend that the generic symbol dog embraces so many unlike individuals of diverse size and form, it bothered him that the dog at 314, seen from the side, should have the same name as the dog at 315, seen from the front. Behind each of these visions of a total semantic code is an appreciation of the absurd pretensions of our own fallible languages. We should remember that to name something is in some sense to claim to know what it is, to know its significance. Indeed, these dreams of semantic utopias remind us that to signify accurately would require that we know, like Adam in his prelapsarian garden, what our universe is. For everything we name implies the otherness, and thus the identity, of everything else from which the act of signification distinguishes the things signified. If we believe that, the, that an accurate interpretation of the Constitution's text vindicates anything remotely resembling the results of the modern practice of judicial review, we must assume that the object of interpretation is written in some hermetic code that mimics the total languages in which divinities undoubtedly converse. Perhaps those who believe themselves committed both to a thoroughgoing originalism uh, and to what is called constitutional law should try to imagine how successful we would be if it were our task to produce a text that would do what we demand of the Constitution. Could we generate a legal code that would in fact answer the unimaginable questions that the inhabitants of that undiscovered country, which is the distant future, will ask of it? To believe that our constitutional text answers such questions today is to assert that its omniscient authors foresaw analogous complexities and that they encoded within that text capacious signifiers a secret discourse revealing all they knew and all we need to know about what's past or passing or to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Campos. Our fourth speaker on this panel is Professor Schauer from the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. And welcome, Professor Schauer. I, it seems to me a lot of your colleagues are folks who I've worked with in various iterations, both in the administrative and legislative branch. Uh, I hope perhaps they've provided some insight on how these things apply in their earlier lives. Professor Schauer. Thank you. I want to do something a little bit odd for an event like this. I want to follow instructions. That is, 
not only do I want to follow the most important instruction of keeping to my designated time, but I also want to follow the instruction that is implicit in the title of this panel. Uh, I have learned a great deal from what has just been said. Most of that seems to be addressing the topic of is originalism possible? At times, is originalism desirable? I want to stick strictly to my instructions, something that I believe is possible, and address the question, what is originalism? Indeed, it is somewhat odd that the question, what is originalism, is the third panel of this event, since we have already had two panels on whether it is desirable or not. One might have thought that trying to figure out what it is ought to have preceded whether or not we ought to have it. Uh, putting that aside, let me follow my instructions and address the question, what is originalism? Implicit in this uh, will be another thing that I believe, that there is a distinction between what is and what ought. I believe that we can make sense out of a fact value distinction. So therefore, I think it is possible to describe what originalism is and leave to others the question whether we ought to have it or not. Now, if we were to start with something at the beginning that looks like a little bit of a definition, we might say that when a conception of originalism or a definition of originalism is something like the following. Prescriptive language is to be understood by reference to evidence of the actual contemporaneous mental states of the inscribers of that language. Now, we have that definition. It encompasses a huge range of activities. We then might say, with that definition behind us, what are we doing when we are talking about originalism? We're offering theories, but what kind of theories or accounts are we offering? And although that may seem self-evident, one of the things that goes on in a fair number of discussions of originalism is that we don't distinguish very well between descriptive accounts and prescriptive accounts. Because if you accept something like the definition that I have just given, then one thing we might say is, is the definition I have just given, understanding prescriptive language, by reference to evidence of the actual contemporaneous mental states of the inscribers of that language. Something that exists, something that is in fact done within a particular domain. So we could ask the factual question, the descriptive question, do judges behave this way in looking at items of law? Do art critics behave this way in looking at items of art or literature or poetry? Do readers, does the do domain or the community of readers of instructions given to them when they go to the supermarket behave in this way when they go to the supermarket? Or we could put the question prescriptively, what ought judges or art critics or the, and the like to do? Again, that's obvious, but it may be worthwhile emphasizing that as we talk about this, one question we could be asking, although I don't see very much asking of it, is what's going on now? Still, I want to turn to what I take to be the more important question when we think about what is originalism. That is, what is originalism a theory of? We are talking about theories of originalism, but I'm not sure we've talked fully about what a theory of originalism would be a theory of. Possibility one, originalism might be a theory of language. We might believe that it is a necessary feature of language use, that language cannot be understood except by reference to the actual contemporaneous mental states of those who use it. 
We might think, therefore, that the words that are used are but evidence of something else, and it is an essential feature of language that it is originalist in this sense. Yet, if language is originalist in this sense, it is hard to imagine why a word, a phrase, an item of language use is an evidence of, is a piece of evidence of one intention rather than another intention, except by virtue of the way in which the thing that is evidence can be evidence of something rather than something else. And if it can be evidence of something rather than something else, then it must have some independent capacity without circular reference to what it is evidence of to be evidence of that, or to put it somewhat more simply. <laughs> the easiest task that will be confronted over the next two days, to put it somewhat more simply, the ability of language to be evidence of something presupposes that language, according to rules of language or according to conventions of language, can loosely put carry meaning itself. If that's right, then it turns out that as a descriptive account of language, originalism is not plausible. That is, originalism as an account of the nature of language is neither descriptively plausible nor prescriptively plausible. Somewhat more plausible is originalism as an account of law. We could say, it is a feature of law that legal language, language appearing in various items that have legal import or legal effect, is to be understood according to the definition that I gave earlier. As a descriptive claim, once again, that's false. Think about, for example, the moderately well accepted, although admittedly controversial, objective theory of contracts, according to which contractual language is to be understood according to conventional meaning of contractual terms rather than according to the mental states of the con contracting parties. Or think about the common law of defamation according to which defamatory utterances might result in legal liability if they have a certain reputation damaging effect regardless of the intentions, regardless of the mental states of the user of that language. And think much more obviously and much more currently about various accounts of statutory interpretation that would focus on plain meaning, that would focus on text, that would focus on literal meaning or ordinary meaning or something of that variety. Implicit in having a so-called textualist or so-called plain meaning account of statutory interpretation is the view that at least in some legal domains, originalism is not to be used. Now, I put it that way to indicate that when we think descriptively about the nature of law, or when we think descriptively about actual legal practice. Although it may be that originalism is not a necessary feature of that practice, nor is the rejection of originalism a necessary feature of that practice. Think, for example, about the large and indeed increasing number of constitutional doctrines in which constitutional import turns on legislatures or other state actors having a particular intention or not. Whether that be in the area of freedom of speech or perhaps most prominently equal protection with Washington versus Davis or a large number of other areas, Wallace versus Jaffrey in terms of freedom of religion, it is a contingent feature of American constitutionalism that constitutional results often turn on the mental states 
of various legislators or various other state actors. So if it turns out that originalism is neither a necessary feature of law nor a necessary feature of language, once we turn to constitutionalism, once we turn to constitutional law, it's probably now somewhat apparent what the conclusion is. If originalism is not a necessary feature of language, if originalism is not a necessary feature of the very idea of law, then it turns out that originalism is not necessarily a function or a necessary feature of trying to understand or make sense of that collection of constraining marks on a printed page that we might call a constitution. To put it that way is not to say anything, and it is my intention not to say anything, about whether and when we would want to understand a constitution in this way. But once we understand that as a question of constitutionalism, nothing about originalism is either necessary as a matter of language or necessary as a matter of law or necessary as a matter of the very idea of having something that we call a constitution that might render certain statutes unconstitutional. It turns out that we are then engaged in a range of political, moral, social, institutional design questions as to which there is more than one answer. In that sense, part of what I'm saying is, broadly speaking, a continuation of the legal realist project, uh, although not in a way that is commonly thought. That is, one of the lessons of legal realism is a continuing skepticism about the tendency of legal actors, lawyers, judges, and legal scholars to disguise in the language of necessity and in the language of inexorability what are in fact political, social, moral, economic, philosophical, or policy choices. Nowhere is this more apparent than in many of the discussions of originalism because both the proponents and opponents of originalism fall into the trap that the legal realists have warned us against. Opponents argue that it is impossible. Proponents argue that it is necessary. And in this continuing battle between impossibility and necessity, there is far less discussion than there ought to be about originalism as a contingent feature of institutional design that may at certain times and in certain places with certain political, moral, and philosophical presuppositions be desirable or not as the case may be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Showard. Um, before we open it up for questions, let me pose a hypothetical to each of the panelists uh, based on a factual incident that happened in this most recent 100 days of Congress. One of the issues that we voted on was an amendment to the Constitution on term limits. And in fact, we voted on several versions of it, but the one that was the final version was silent on the question of whether that new amendment to the Constitution would preempt various states' efforts to apply term limits to members of Congress, an issue which is proceeding through to the courts. The author of the amendment stated on the record that he desired the preemption of those state initiatives. He also introduced into the record a legal memo by various scholars that the, his version of the amendment would not have any effect on the existing court case. Uh, that whether the court determined to uphold those laws or not would not be affected by this new amendment, thus implying that there was no effective preemption of the states. And the text itself was silent on the question of preemption. How would your understanding of originalism, if say the constitutional amendment actually had passed and been in, acted by the states, and there were a case coming up where 
one of the members of Congress from a state that had a different term limit was asked to give up their seat and had been sued, or they perhaps had sued the citizens of their district, something, by the way, which is not very politically wise, but <laughs> say they had actually engaged in this lawsuit. And the court in this future date was asked to decide whether or not this new amendment to the Constitution preempted this state requirement that effectively told this member of Congress they had to give up their seat. My question in the hypothetical is, how would your understanding of original if, originalism, if the judge sought to be an originalist, how would that inform their decision in that case? Let me give a couple of possibilities. Possibility number one, given that there was such explicit discussion and given that a large number of people who heard the explicit discussion then proceeded to adopt a document not containing that. One possibility is that this is fairly strong evidence of quite explicit original intention not to be bound by those particular intentions since after all, having been heard, it would have been easy enough to put it into the document. Possibility number two, in cases of interpretive doubt, reclaim exactly what it is that you have just mentioned and use that to resolve the interpretive doubt. Possibility number three, reclaim those intentions with or without the possibility of interpretive doubt. That is, and I, one of the things that was looming over your question is that one need not make, even if one is an originalist, one need not make recourse to original intentions unless there is some form of indeterminacy, vagueness, ambiguity, or some other linguistic breakdown in the text. Another possibility is that texts are subservient to original intentions, and therefore another possibility might be that judges having access to the very original intent that you describe ought to use that and ought to use the text as only a piece of evidence helping them find that. It seems to me that, at least consistent with what I was saying before, the choice among these and the choice whether to adopt any of these or a choice to say, who cares? in much the same way that we might interpret a work of art or a work of literature by saying, who cares what Picasso intended with Guernica? We are interpreting the work on a printed page. The choice among those is, I think, for me, ultimately an institutional and political choice. My institutional and political choice is for the last mentioned one of my options, to say, who cares? but I don't deny that it's a political, institutional, and moral choice. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Uh, I, I would just um, say that the, really the question here, one of the things which Fred didn't mention, is, is that this is in part simply an instance of what Larry said before. The question part here is who is Fred? Uh, with regard to a constitutional amendment, if we look at conventionally understood ways of making a constitutional amendment, how a constitutional amendment comes to be a constitutional amendment, it is the, uh, the shared will of a certain number of human beings. Some of those are in Congress. Some of those are in state legislatures. The, what's said or not said on, in Congress is relevant to that. What's said out in the wide world while state legislatures are discussing this issue is relevant. And finally, one has to, uh, a judge looking at this finally has to ask, uh, what is the better guess? Uh, as to whether or not this was a uh, part of the shared will of the people whose, whose uh, votes made this uh, constitutional amendment part of the Constitution. And, and part of what was happening in this particular case was that by remaining silent on the text, different proponents of that amendment could adopt different interpretations. There, there were members of Congress who wanted to preempt the various state statutes, uh, interpreted the silence and the, and the desire of the author of the amendment 
as a justification that it would do so. Um, others did not want to preempt state amendments and use the legal memo that was introduced into the record as solace to their view that it did not preempt the states. And so in, in some ways it was Larry's example where you had two diverse intents of the individual actors who were voting on it, at least in the House. Well, this, this illustrates, this is one example of many that illustrates why uh, an original intention um, theory cannot stand alone. There, there have to be other pre-constitutional norms to supplement it because there will be many cases where uh, first, you need norms about how to, you know, whose, in, whose intentions count, how you add them up in these kinds of cases. But then you also have norms uh, about what to do in cases that have to be resolved. And yet, uh, on any theory of original intentions, there is no result. This has not been determined. There is just no determination by Fred of, uh, of, of this particular issue. And the issue needs to be resolved. It needs to be resolved at the level uh, that Fred's, uh, the level of authority that Fred's determinations are usually given. So you need at least other norms to supplement this. Uh, you know, Anthony, I, I, I agree that this is the, the circumstance which has been described. That is a circumstance where there, where there is no congruence of a sufficient number of human wills to make the, to make the relevant proposal law on the same meaning can happen. But I guess I disagree with Larry in case there'll be many cases of that. I, I again think that's sort of inconsistent with the way people generally use language. People may well have different meanings attached to language, but in the ordinary case, this may be an exception, but in the ordinary case, uh, those differences are about ranges of meaning about a, around a central meaning uh, and not about conflicting meanings. And it's only in the case of conflicting meanings that this problem's gonna arise. I, I wanna add one thing, I, I wanna disagree with uh with Richard about that. I think that most legal argumentation involves these kinds of cases. Uh, and I think the mistake we make is to think that because we ask a question about a legal text, it's a coherent question. I think very often it's not a coherent question. I think this is an example, not through any fault of the political process necessarily. Second point, um, I think it's just, uh, I think it is incoherent to say the text is clear but the intention is ambiguous or the text is ambiguous or the intention is clear. The way you know the text is clear is because you know the intention. The way you know the text is ambiguous is because you can't figure out the intention or indetermine it, I should say. I think it, it's at least to a confusion of tongues when we see those as two separate issues, which I don't think they can be. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, let's see, Dan Farber, I guess I'm, I'm supposed to do that. Um, I have a question um, that in some ways relates to uh, uh, the last thing that Fred said, uh, which contrasted his preferred approach where we don't care about mental states with originalism. And what I find confusing, um, genuinely confusing, I was originally, I mean, people say that when they're just trying to say you're wrong, but, uh, <laughs> but I actually am confused. At one point I was slated to be on this panel and I was happy to be moved because I decided I didn't really understand what originalism was. Um, what I find confusing is that there are some people who seem to be regarded as originalists who I think agree with Fred. Uh, Frank Easterbrook uh, comes to mind. Uh, I think maybe Charles Freed. Uh, and a number of other people who seem to be saying that no, what, when we talk about original intent, we're not talking about anybody's m mental state. Uh, and I wondered if the panelists could comment on that I'm, observation. I think here, the, the confusion is, I mean, I don't consider it a confusion, but the, the conflation of what might be two different views is quite understandable, indeed, it was first noticed, I believe, in a quite important but now forgotten book by Richard Wasserstrom called The Judicial Decision, in which Wasserstrom talks about precedent, original intentions, and more obvious forms of rule-based decision-making, all as different forms of being obeisant to the past. One way that we might think of originalism is saying originalism broadly conceived, and I hear some of this in what Dick was saying, originalism broadly conceived recognizes the very pastness, the very way in which we are bound by a decision made earlier, 
that goes along with my narrower conception, that goes along with what is sometimes called textualism, and that goes along with taking precedent seriously. I don't think that there's, we're dealing with a slippery enough term that I feel that I can be, uh, for my purposes, only an arbiter of linguistic usage. I want to say, without denying the very important pastness of a more text-oriented approach to interpretation, sometimes associated with Judge Easterbrook, uh, one that I have at times adopted and others, it's not linguistically inappropriate to call it originalism, but I think that there's an important distinction that I want to mark that's collapsed by using originalism for that and for the mental state approach. Well, I, I'm not sure this is directly responsive, but I, I mean, there's a, you know, we can call anything originalism, uh, anything that looks to the past. Uh, I'm not sure though that, um, that we've, we've banished um, psychological states. I mean, it seems to me that, that what you're calling textualism is sort of a collaborative effort. Um, we, we look to the mental states of people we call the framers to determine, in a sense, uh, uh, what kinds of uh, marks they were putting on, what language they were, they were determining. And then we look to the mental states of people who, who, who wrote dictionaries or, or in, in 1787 or something, sort of collaborative, um, you know, uh, intentional exercises by two different groups. It, it's, when you stop and think about textualism that way, it's a kind of an odd theory uh, that one, you know, in terms of, uh, that's an odd uh, collaboration in a sense, uh, especially if we happen to think that it's, it's something like a mindless turning over of something to uh, turning over our typewriters, which are keyed up in English letters to a bunch of monkeys who then pants on. It's not quite that mindless, but it has a certain, you know, an element of chance in it, which makes it a kind of an interesting collaboration. But I think there, there's, there is, I mean, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with uh, compounding isms. Nevertheless, we may be doomed to them. There is what we might think of as a, is an even stronger form of textualism. We might say, forget the 1787 or 1791 dictionaries. There are certain marks on a printed page that in 1995, as an empirical fact, the people of the United States treat as the Constitution, the ultimate rule of recognition, the Grunt norm, the pre-constitutional rule, call it what you will. It is a part of that rule of recognition that those marks will be interpreted according to the conventions of language in force in 1995. Now we can have a political argument about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing to do, but it's hardly inconceivable. I mean, the, the question uh, about textualism is really a question about legitimacy. The, and the, the way Fred has put it, I think, is, is helpful. There is no doubt that we, can't, we could have a government like this, which essentially interprets the Constitution of 1787 according to the linguistic conventions of 1995. The question is, if we decided to do that, what license is there for, in fact, basing our decisions on the 1787 Constitution? Once we're using 1995, why don't we use the Uruguay Constitution of 1915? Um, apparently, we choose the 1787 Convention as amended because there is something about our present political inclinations which accords a special sense of legitimacy to the act of Constitution making. And to cut off that act seems to me to cut off the thing that makes the Constitution law. Thank you. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add, Professor Campbell? Uh, yeah, I just like, want to say one thing, uh, which might be overstating it, but I, I just think that the kinds of procedures we're talking about here are, are quite literally impossible. I don't think that it is possible to say, we will interpret these marks according to the conventions of language enforced in 1995, because that is to beg the question. There is no one thing, the English language, which exists in 1995. That's an abstraction. It is a theoretical abstraction, which is, which is heuristically useful, but which is not empirically valid. If you're going to start then slicing and dicing and figuring out what 
what we would call speakers of English mean by these particular remarks. You have to say, well, these, these speakers over here would mean one thing, these speakers over there would mean another, and then you're going to have to deploy some theory. So uh, I think the basic distinction between textualism and interpretation is that textualism is to do something with words, like all theories of interpretation are, while interpretation, per se, is to try to figure out what the words mean. The facticity of that is uh, got to be a question about mental states, somebody's. And uh, that's the distinction in my mind. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, Sandy Levinson. I would um, actually want to build on Dane Farber's question in this discussion. Um, partly, this also anticipates the panel tomorrow on the 14th Amendment. Because it seems to me that it is useful to talk about who is an originalist to try to get some sense of what originalism is. That, thus, Dan invoked uh, Frank Easterbrook and Charles Freed. It occurred to me that this conference, quite justifiably, is honoring a truly wonderful man, Raoul Berger, who I think in anybody's list of originalists would be an originalist. But I also think it's a fact, which may or may not be a sad fact, that very few people agree with Professor Berger in terms of the how originalism works in terms, let us say, of the meaning of the 14th Amendment. Former Attorney General Meese does not. Uh, Robert Bork does not. Both took some pains in their various speeches and writings about originalism, and in particular, the validity of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and former Attorney General Meese wrote in his speech that Plessy versus Ferguson had been wrongly decided, which requires, among other things, collapsing the distinction between civil rights, political rights, and social rights, which is certainly part of the operative political language of 1866, 68. Um, so our former Attorney General Meese and former Judge Bork kind of originalist wannabes, but not reallys, because there are indeed other sorts of values in the world besides a burger kind of originalism. Is it the case that, one, one, that when one thinks it through that Professor Berger presents ultimately an unsatisfactory form of originalism, but Bork and Mies present a much more satisfactory one, but then what do we do with Easterbrook and uh, Freed? And it does seem to me that it is useful to talk about these people, not only because you know, they're, they're concrete uh, articulators, but because they themselves play very different roles. And it may be that one could get tenure at a very fine university by being a hell-bent originalist. But could you, in fact, be the Attorney General of the United States, or a member of Congress, or a member of any court, and be a hell-bent originalist of the Burger variety? And I suggest the answer is no. I mean, I, I think the empirical evidence is fairly strong. The answer is no. Because rightly or wrongly, nobody will plead guilty to being an originalist of just the kind that Rao Berger is, which involves delegitimating Brown versus Board of Education. So you've got to be the Brown is all right, and perhaps the Plessy was wrong and Dred Scott was wrong, sort of originalist. And then one starts wondering, what kind of originalist is that? What about, one possibility is, what about the notion of presumptive originalism? I'm no kind of originalist. But one quite plausible possibility for me in understanding your characterization of Bork and Nice is that they are presumptive originalists. That is the initial source for them of interpretation. It is the weighty form of interpretation. But in particularly exigent cases, it might be overridden by a combination of political, moral, social, economic, or whatever values that have enormous weight. If you believe that there is a difference between proof beyond a reasonable doubt and proof by a preponderance of the evidence, 
If you believe that there is a difference between a rational basis test and a compelling interest test, you might believe that presumptions matter. And if you believe that presumptions matter, one could still be substantially guided by an originalist approach while recognizing that certain moral, political, or flat out pragmatic exigencies are so overwhelming that they override the presumption in just the way that certain interests might be compelling. One very quick point, apropos of Richard Kay's comments, this seems, though, to reintroduce politics oh, yeah. into law with a vengeance, which is fine with me, but I, I gather that the whole point of the originalist enterprise, uh, at least in its original formulation some 10 or 15 years ago, was to reinscribe a strong separation between but legal one, analysis and but politics. One, it seems to me that it reintroduces it, but phenomenologically it might reintroduce it in a much lesser way. That is, take these other things into account only when they intrude themselves onto your consciousness in an overwhelming way, but do not think about them regularly as part of the enterprise. Uh, yes, it doesn't eliminate it to zero, but it, it may significantly change the nature of the work that's actually done by the people doing it. Simply, it's just that some original intent is not politically feasible. It's all saying. It's not politically proved but a pure scholar like Walt Berger can state it as its own line of Others who are involved in politics have to judge someone. But a pure it's not be surprising. But, <laughs> but it's also but <laughs> those of us who like to think that they are pure scholars but are not in the business of prescribing to judges what they ought to do, but rather trying to understand, might say that one thing a pure scholar could do trying to understand the practice is try to understand as a descriptive matter the interplay between an overwhelming but not absolute force and something that may at times override it. All I'm saying is that I can make conceptual sense out of that idea. If I can make conceptual sense out of that idea, it seems to me that it is not necessarily illegitimate to put it into practice. It may not be desirable, but I don't think that the distinction, I don't think that it is definitional of a pure scholar that one has to believe that strong, very important values are necessarily non-overridable. That's a pure scholar may believe that, but someone could be a pure scholar and not believe that. Uh, any of the other panelists wish to Yeah, I, I'd like to say something. Um, earlier in, in an earlier panel, it was suggested that the appropriate, uh, the appropriate metaphor for the, for, for the proper practice of judicial review is abstinence. Uh, and I'd like to suggest that a descriptive matter, the, the proper metaphor is basically safe sex. That's really what people want. And it's part of sort of the, the consumerist culture of the country, uh, what people want is they want law, but they also want like good results, right? They want like low fattening hot fudge, right? They they want uh, you know they want to pay they don't want to pay taxes, but they want their roads not to have potholes in them, right? I mean, this is not exactly you know, rocket science; it's sort of basic political theory, right? And I think that the, the practices of our judges are, are quite coterminous with that. What they do is they tell us they're doing law, but in fact they're doing something else, right? And then we have you know sort of fancy theory comes along and say, oh yes, but you see you really is law because we just fold in all this other stuff too and we can do both things. We can we can have fidelity to the past and we, we can do exactly what we want at the present time and uh, and even and there's no tension between those things. And I think that's a, a sort of an abiding flaw and strength of American culture that we just we can't perceive that there might actually be incompatible desires in the world, right? We just want to do everything um, at the same time. And, uh, that's my view of it. Will you permit the devil to speak for himself? <laughs> First of all, let me escape from pure scholarship. I'm no more pure than the next fellow, and I would also wonder whether anybody's purer than I am. 
And let me also introduce a factual uh, aspect to our theoretical discussion. First, I ask you to bear in mind that when I published in 1977, I wasn't creating a Procrustean bed. I was directing myself to two questions, and one of them I dare say is incontrovertible. I maintained what Justice Harlan said, that the exclusion of suffrage from the 14th Amendment was irrefutable and unrefuted. There are at least a dozen commentators that agree today that suffrage was included. That means that one man, one vote was patently and utterly unconstitutional. It represented revision. Now that sort of thing, of course, you've got to allow for the fact that I came out of these all 60 years ago, so I'm an old-fashioned lawyer. All of this philosophical palaver is a little over my head. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, again, I say to you, there aren't too many propositions that a lawyer can maintain that really are irrefutable. But I would stake my life on it. Then one can say categorically, suffrage was excluded from the 14th Amendment. Now you've got to face up to that. There may be a thousand other cases where original intent will be of no use to you. But that's one. Now the second one, the case for the exclusion of suffrage uh, of, uh, seg of uh, segregation isn't quite as clear. But again, some facts. In the District of Columbia, over which Congress had plenary jurisdiction, they excluded, they had separate schools for black children and white children. Sumner tried for years to change that and was rejected. Now if we approach this not as philosophers, but just as common men. Is it conceivable that a Congress which refused to create equal access to schools in a district would then cram down the throats of the states the necessity of having mixed schools? That's just one element. Again, I'm going to I won't take the time now because I'm hoping to do this tomorrow. There's still, a, there's a justification f for original intention which hasn't been mentioned at all and which to an old fashioned lawyer is rather surprising. And that is a tradition of 800 years. There are a great many conventions in the law which aren't as old as that which we respect. But here we are, a bunch of young lions who have social agendas and who want to cast all of that in a discard. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Berger. Any one, further comment? I mean, one, one can agree with all of that except for one word, the word unconstitutional. That is, that may be the very question that we're contesting. It is possible that one can agree that certain things were unmistakably intended in one way, but the question of whether those unmistakable intentions should be given force is itself a constitution, is itself a question in which some of the philosophical palaver is unavoidable. That now it is possible that we want to answer that question by reference to 800 years of tradition. But given that over 800 years, some traditions have changed and some have not. One of the things that's being talked about is which are the traditions that should change and how much and how often. After all, a great number of legal traditions do in fact change. 
those of us who are trying to understand it rather than push strongly in one direction or another um, may be a little bit removed from that, but it is certainly a big, a big part of what people who do normative constitutional scholarship, and I've done some myself and I do less and less as I get older, um, think that they are doing is saying, some of the things that were around 800 years ago are good. Some of the things that are around 800 years ago are not. And we're trying to move some of the traditions. Uh, I think that most people who do normative constitutional scholarship wouldn't deny that. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I referred in my paper to our, our pre-constitutional norms, our presuppositions. It may be that one of the things that's occurring, and perhaps it's just because we've become more self-conscious about this in a way, is that it's a mistake to, to talk about those as if there was some sort of consensus on, on these matters. It may, not, it may be the case that if at one time there, there was, we all had a constitution, it may be that we now have different constitutions. They all refer to the same document, but our, our, the presuppositions that we bring to the document may be so different that we can't, we can no longer say there is, uh, there is a constitution there. Uh, we, we, we may be in a, in a, in a state in which, in which uh, you know, if it, you know, God help me, but if it weren't for the Supreme Court, we wouldn't have any, any uh, sort of common Constitution. I think Paul is right. You know, you ask the average person, uh, uh, you know, it, you know what the Constitution is. They will refer you to the to the thing in the National Archives. They probably would refer you to the intention of the people who drafted. I think that's also right. If you also tell them in there that if you if you refer to the intentions of the people who drafted it, it probably doesn't get rid of segregation. It probably doesn't uh, uh, deal with a uh, uh, right of privacy or things like that. They would say, "Oh my God, you know, uh, what have I been you know, swearing allegiance to all these years?" Or they would just deny flat out that I that what I said was correct about it. Now that just means that we may be, you know, there may be some sort of constitutional crisis that we're we're sitting on top of, and that and that that's what these kinds of uh, meetings reveal. We've lost that tradition uh, that that may have given us a certain a constitution in the past. We may have too many constitutions in the present. Let me see, I, let me see, I agree with, with Larry's kind of uh, 30 second capsule of uh, understanding of the uh, of average people as to what makes the constitution legitimate. Uh, I also agree that there is kind of radical dissensus uh, in the uh, scholarly class as to what the constitution is. I'm not sure that the latter event creates a crisis. <laughs> it would Thank be you. a crisis if it was just art. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Eugene Volokh, uh, UCLA Law School. I wanted to ask, sort of, toss out a specific example and see what, what sort of the originalist view of it is, sort of on the theory that what original is, what originalism is, is sort of what originalism does, and it comes in the speech and press clause area, which is an area where even Scalia, for example, almost never refers to original intent or original meaning or anything like this, um, and just take. Any, let's say for convenience, the first or something based on the first uh, uh, congressional act that that, uh, that the court struck struck down, having to do with uh, posting of communist matter. Let's say that uh, that uh, Congress passes a law barring uh, uh, the sending. This is modification of the of the actual facts of the case uh, uh, that that says that the mail will not deliver. Uh, communist propaganda. Or let's say, for example, it passes a law barring campaign-related expenditures or campaign-related contributions. Um, what would an originalist say? What is originalism with respect to that law and that amendment? I mean, you could say that it's the text. And some might say, well, because something is speech or press, therefore it's absolutely protected because that's what the text says. Or you could, although few people say that, you could say that it's the intention of the people who drafted it. And one might, for instance, bring in Madison's writings on this. But then one might bring in the writings of other people who participated in the ratification process, and they may say something different. 
You could say that it's the original meaning of the phrase at the time, and uh, Professor Berger suggests uh, uh, that, uh, that certainly at least as the 14th and 15th Amendments, there may be a pretty well distinguishable original meaning of those things, uh, or perhaps even original intention. But that seems hard to say about the First Amendment, that uh, the, the notion that it only bars prior restraints doesn't seem to be uh, well established, but no contrary view is either. Uh, one could say that it's a kind of the general kind of principle behind it, but then the question comes up what the principle is. One could also say a fifth thing, which is that this question belongs not to this panel, but to the historical indeterminacy panel, and that originalism doesn't give the answers to some questions, uh, and in that case we bounce back to some other theory. But to the extent that originalism denies the legitimacy of many other theories, that might undercut even that. And to the extent that something as basic as the meaning of, actually, I would imagine many of the original, uh, of the original Bill of Rights, uh, 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 something that doesn't give us much of an answer as to that, the question is, I mean, is originalism that much? So you know, with respect to this question, what is originalism? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have a different answer than those offered? <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, sure. I'll give you a 10 second answer, okay? You could say all those things, and in fact, people do say all those things. And therefore, I have difficulty understanding exactly what people mean when they say, this is unimpeachably the answer to some question of constitutional law that rises above a Rule 11 sanction level, although I follow Professor Levinson here not knowing exactly what that is either, right? So I, I, what, I guess what I'm saying is that you have, a, a, you have a heavily incoherent legal discourse in which all those things are being said simultaneously and in which another thing that is being said simultaneously is that it's all coherent at the same time. Um, now that's rather uncomfortable, but I just think that's the empirical situation. Well, and you're suggesting that, that those those answers are all said and are all somewhat right. inconsistent. But is there an, an answer that I'm, originalism, some form of originalism, will give us? I told you number two. But but number. <laughs> <laughs> but how would number two apply here? Yeah. I mean, this in a way, it's an odd question. I mean, I come back what what Paul just said, uh, sort of the empirical or descriptive way. If we were, one way of thinking about the question is, it seems to me moderately clear that the best characterization of the development of First Amendment doctrine from 1919 to 1995 is as a process of common law development that doesn't look dramatically different from the way in which torts, contracts, and other things have been developed. Now, we can then engage in discussions about, normative discussions about how that can be squared with some theoretical ideas, including but not limited to originalism. But it may be that the starting descriptive point is that it seems that in a number of areas of which free speech, freedom of religion, maybe, but free speech, pretty certainly, equal protection, pretty certainly, are best descriptively characterized as common law development. What that tells us for purposes of normative theory, I don't know. I, I, I'm comfortable with the description. Uh, Professor McConnell? Uh, I'm interested in the difference between meaning and intention, which Richard Kay particularly emphasized, and I also think was the undertone of part of uh, Paul Campos's remarks too. So let me put my question especially to you too. Uh, 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 let me just give a quick example. Uh, let's suppose that the Equal Rights Amendment had in fact been uh, enacted by two thirds of the relevant group, uh, but there was a big question about whether that meant that women would have to be subject to the draft. And let's assume that uh, among the two thirds supporting the amendment, uh, half of them, that is a third of the population, said, yeah, women will be drafted, that's a good thing. Another half of them, that is a third of the population, says, uh, says no, uh, women, it, it would be terrible to have to draft women, and what's more, this amendment doesn't mean that, and that's why we're for it. And then a third of the population is against the amendment, and one of the reasons they're against it is because they think it's going to lead to uh, drafting women. Uh, note that two-thirds of the population favor the amendment, 
two-thirds of the population think it means that women will be drafted, and two-thirds of the population are against drafting women. Um, how do we deal with this? Um, I'll tell you what's, what makes sense to me, given the, uh, the underlying questions of authority, which I think uh, support the version of interpretation which I suggested. Uh, first thing which would, would, uh, we would do is I, I think it is not relevant what the people who, the, who did not participate in the making of the amendment as law thought. The lawmakers in this case were the people who helped make the, the, the amendment law, which were the people who in the legislatures and the Congress essentially voted in favor. Uh, second, we would have to have, in order for you, to, for you to be right, it would have to be the case that the numbers would have to split exactly as, as, one, as, as you've suggested. Um, I, I, needless to say, the evidence on this is going to be a, a matter of dispute. Um, there, so that one may have the view that a, majority, that, that a relevant majority thought women should be uh, inclu included in the draft, the relevant majority did not, or the, the, the view is the relevant, the, uh, there was no relevant majority for either position. Um, if one genuinely thought that, uh, then I think it would, it would follow that there, there was no intention to extend the meaning of the phrase, uh, no intention to extend the meaning of the phrase of the amendment to include that eventuality. And that looking at the amendment as a change in the Constitution, one would have to ask, how, what, one would have to say, how far did that change go supported by the relevant, uh, by the relevant lawmakers? In this case, it wouldn't go that far. Um, I think that if the, there are two things to note. The first is that this is what I believe in the philosophical literature is known as a desert island example, in that you've got this extremely clean hypothetical uh, for the purposes of, of making a point, which is, of course, uh, perfectly valid, but which is also uh, ex extremely uh, tenuously connected to actual legal events, which, of course, are always uh, almost infinitely more complicated than something like that. Uh, and this ties into the second point, which is if you in fact had such a situation, in my view, you would have uh, two, uh, you would actually have uh, uh, three texts, if I'm getting this right. The, the text of those who are in favor of the amendment and who think it, it makes women eligible for the draft, the text of the, of the people who are in favor of the amendment who don't think it makes eligible women, uh, women eligible for the draft, and then the text of those who, uh, uh, who are against the amendment, but that text would not be, uh, of course, legally uh, enacted. Now, what you do with those two texts then requires a further theory of political obligation. It cannot be decided by a question of interpretation. You can't say that I've got a, I've got a theory of interpretation which tells you which text you enact, because in no interpretive act is going to tell you what to do with a text. All it's going to tell you is that you have a text. Uh, but folding it into the first point, uh, I think the important thing to note here is that in fact, in most legal situations of this kind, when you are attempting to determine what the text of a, of a, uh, uh, a constitutionally complex situation really requires, what you are usually, uh, you're actually talking about is a fragmentary situation of thousands of different texts, uh, and the problem of amalgamating them in some uh, empirically and normatively, uh, in empirically plausible and normatively desirable way may well be completely impossible. But what I want to insist on here is the fact that you have an empirically nightmare situation on your hands doesn't mean that you don't have a empirically nightmare, nightmare situation on your hands, which is what many of the uh, anti-originalist people like to claim, which is that the consequences of this view are very bad and therefore it's not true. 